Okay, thank you very much. And thanks uh, so much for inviting me. I'm of course extremely jealous of everyone who's actually there in Vienna. Um, it's like uh, Leia, like you're living on some different planet or something. But uh, okay, so let's uh, get started. So um, first of all, is that working for everyone? You can see what's up there. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, I just wanna start with some sort of parental advisory about uh, today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture, which is that um, th these are meant to be some sort of uh, overview. So I will be technically loose at times, but if something is confusing you or you're worried about something I've said, just interrupt me uh, uh, so, so that we can make sure we're not uh, confusing each other. So um, okay, I'd like to start uh, with just some sort of broad uh, question here. Uh, what is twister theory? Um, it may be that already over the course of this program, you've um, sort of had some answers uh, to this uh, to this question. But, uh, broadly speaking, uh, if we just want to speak heuristically, usually what one means by twisty, twister theory is uh, some sort of non-local and holomorphic uh, correspondence. Uh, between space-time, uh, or at least certain classes of space-time, and uh, some uh, complex projective varieties. Now, if you're uh, coming from more of a physics background, uh, and maybe those last uh, that last clutch of words doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, don't worry, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about a very concrete example today. But anyway, uh, if if you kind of don't learn anything else uh, from from me in the next uh, in the next hour, uh, this is the message I would uh, have you take away: that when you hear someone uh, rattling on about twister theory, what they're talking about is some non-local correspondence between kind of physical data on a space time on one hand and some geometric, complex geometric data on some projective space or projective variety uh, on the other. Okay, so today uh, we're gonna focus on one very particular uh, example uh, of twister theory, which uh, is gonna be looking at uh, complexified four-dimensional Minkowski space. So we're going to study the twister theory uh, or talk about the twister theory of this space. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, scattering amplitudes, tree level scattering amplitudes in certain uh, massless quantum field theories on this space. And I'll denote this space by kind of blackboard bold uh, M. So uh, what do I mean by complexified uh, four dimensional Minkowski space? Well, I just mean C4 with coordinates X0 x1, x2, x3. So I think of these as holomorphic uh, coordinates on C4. Uh-oh, of course, this has decided to freeze now. Oh, dear. Let's see if I can uh, freeze it. Sorry, you guys. This is what I get for using uh, some sort of Microsoft software. The gods punish me. Oh, it's still not working. Okay, that means we'll have to close it and start again. Sorry about this. Uh, okay. Really sorry about this. This was working earlier when I tested it. So, um, okay, now it seems to be back at it. All right, we'll try this one more time. Well, no, we're going to try it infinitely until it works because this is the only option. So, uh, there we go. Okay, is that, can, can you all see that now? Okay, 
I'll take that as a yes. Um, okay, so all that I mean by complexified Minkowski space is C4 uh, equipped with a holomorphic metric, which is just ds squared is equal to dx naught squared, uh, sorry, minus dx1 squared minus dx2 squared minus dx3 squared. So it's just Minkowski space, but where we've holomorphically complexified uh, the coordinates. And of course, that means that the signature is completely meaningless. So you can get various real slices uh, of this uh, complexified four-dimensional Minkowski space just by, um, just by picking different real slices uh, of, of C4. So obviously, uh, we can get uh, Lorentzian uh, real R1, comma, 3. That we just get by taking each one of these uh, holomorphic coordinates xa to be real valued. We could get Euclidean R4 uh, just by taking x0 to be real and x1, x2, x3 to be purely imaginary, uh, and so on and, and so forth. So really the, the idea, or at least for me, part of the philosophy of twister theory is you work in these complexified settings. And then if you want to get kind of Euclidean real or your Lorentzian real uh, results, at the end of the day, you just restrict to one of these real slices. And usually that's a more or less easy uh, thing to do. So, okay. So working in four dimensions is great because uh, it allows us to use um, something called the two-spinner formalism, but uh, that's just a fancy word uh, for the isomorphism. Um, so we exploit the fact that SO4C, uh, this is um, as a Lie algebra, isomorphic to SL2C cross SL2C. And that means that everywhere we have a kind of Lorentz uh, vector or form index, uh, we can replace it with two spinner, a pair of two spinner indices. So um, I'm sure lots of people in this crowd are already very familiar with this technology. But so that means that we can replace a sort of four vector form co vector. Whoa. Vector indices uh, with spinners. Um, and practically, that's actually a very easy thing to do. And we all know the tools uh, to do it. It's just given by, this isomorphism is just realized by contraction uh, with the Pauli matrices. So um, if I have, uh, so given uh, some four vector, say VA, I then define it in this two spinner formalism by just contracting uh, with the Pauli matrices, sigma A, alpha, alpha dot, and then I normalize by a square root of two, uh, VA. And in components, this will give you a two by two matrix uh, whose components are just one over square root two, V zero plus V three, V one plus I, V2, V1 minus I, V2, and V0 minus V3. Okay, so you can do this with any uh, vector, one, any tensor you like. You can always just replace these uh, uh, usual kind of Lorentz vector indices or co-vector indices with pairs of, um, whoops, I've done that wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, VA, sorry. So this object we would call V alpha alpha dot, okay? So a vector becomes a two by two matrix and these uh, spinner indices are um, raised and lowered using the natural SL2 uh, invariant inner product, which is just given by the Levi-Civita tensor, um, or Levi-Civita symbol. In 2D. So 
So again, what do I mean by that practically? I mean, if I have some uh, SL2 spinner index downstairs, let me say uh, A beta, I contract that with an epsilon alpha beta upstairs, and that defines for me the, end, uh, the, the spinner with the index upstairs. So there's a kind of general rule. There's always some conventions up for grabs in this game. And the conventions we work with is that you pull spinner indices up to the left and pull spinner indices down to the right. So that means that uh, if I wanted to define the downstairs uh, spinner, I would take a beta epsilon beta alpha. And here are my conventions, uh, say for epsilon uh, alpha beta, this is just zero, one, minus one, zero. Okay, and similarly for the dotted uh, SL2 spinner indices, so the indices of the opposite chirality. We have the exact same set of conventions where you just replace all the indices that I just wrote with, with dotted spinner indices. So you might say, okay, this is like a cool uh, linear algebraic fact, but, um, but what's it good for? And uh, so one immediate cool consequence of this, so one cool consequence of uh, working in this formalism is that it gives an unconstrained way to specify null vectors. So in particular, let's, let's observe that the Minkowski metric, the complexified Minkowski metric written in this two spinner formalism becomes ds squared is equal to epsilon alpha beta, epsilon alpha dot beta dot, dx alpha alpha dot, dx beta beta dot. So that means that uh, v squared, so given, so, given some vector uh, VA, the norm of that vector, that's just uh, epsilon alpha beta, epsilon alpha dot beta dot, V alpha alpha dot, V beta beta dot, where these two by two matrices are defined by contraction with the uh, Pauli matrices as we just uh, did above. Sorry, let me show you that expression again. Okay. Um, and, uh, it turns out that that's, you easily uh, see that that's equal to twice times the determinant of this uh, two by two spinorial representation um, of the vector. So that's true for any vector. So if V is a null vector, then in particular, that means that its determinant vanishes. And uh, as long as it's a non-zero null vector, uh, the vanishing of its determinant uh, is equivalent to saying that it's simple. So that means that we can write V alpha alpha dot uh, we can decompose it into two spinners of opposite chirality. So we could say, uh, call this A alpha, A twiddle, alpha dot. And of course, that's an if and only if statement. So uh, not only uh, given a null vector, it clearly admits uh, such a spinorial decomposition, but also given any two spinners of opposite chirality, that defines for us uh, a null vector. So this is what I mean when I say that this two spinner formalism gives a kind of unconstrained way to think about um, uh, think about null data. You just hand me any two, uh, a dotted and an undotted uh, SL2 spinner, uh, and I, you, that defines automatically a, um, a null vector in, in four dimensional Minkowski space. Now, um, that, that, that null vector is defined up to a scale. So, in terms of the spinners, because uh, I can clearly take, say, the undotted null vector and rescale it by any non-vanishing complex number, say, R, while simultaneously uh, scaling the dotted uh, spinner by one over R. So that's for all non-vanishing complex numbers, R. And that will preserve uh, the two by two matrix V alpha alpha dot. So you might think, well, geez, there seems to be some redundancy here, but that redundancy is precisely the little group of uh, massless vectors in four dimensions. So this C, C star, that's exactly uh, the redundancy that you should be expecting. So anyway, this is all kind of built in, um, built into this two spinner formalism. And again, I'm sure for many of you, this is not, uh, not something new. Okay, but now maybe let's, uh, let's try to um, do something uh, slightly new, uh, which is to talk about twister theory. 
So twister space. So the reason why we're bothering with this um, two-spinner formalism is because it's the natural way to express uh, this twister correspondence that, that's the main thing we're gonna be talking about today. So to do this, uh, let's first define um, complex projective three space. So um, this is something called CP3. Again, I'm sure for many of us, this is something we're very familiar with, but um, the kind of nicest way to describe this is in terms of homogeneous coordinates. So uh, we define uh, homogeneous coordinates, uh, which are just four complex numbers. Let me call them ZA. So that's some Z0, Z1, Z2, and Z3, such that they can't all be zero. So as a, if you like, as a four vector, that ZA cannot be equal to zero. And they're all equivalent up to scale. So, so they're considered, they're, they're, we identify Zs that are related by an overall uh, complex rescaling. So in particular, um, if I take uh, ZA and I multiply it by any non-vanishing complex number, again, for all R and C star, uh, I have to count that as equivalent to ZA not multiplied uh, by that uh, non-vanishing complex number. So in, in that way, even though there are four of these homogeneous coordinates, they describe a three complex dimensional space. And of course, locally, uh, you can define, you can obtain affine coordinates on uh, the patches of CP3 just by saying, okay, so the homogeneous coordinates can't all vanish. So in particular, that means one of them doesn't vanish, say Z0. And then I identify everything up to scale. So then I can just divide all four of these guys by Z0. And then the coordinates would become one, uh, one Z1 over Z0, Z2 over Z0, Z3 over Z0, right? And then these three complex numbers would be the affine coordinates on the patch uh, where Z0 is not equal to zero and so on and so forth. Again, I'm sure we're all familiar with this. But now um, if we're gonna do something that at first just looks like a bit of weird notation, which is we're gonna choose to write um, these affine coordinates uh, as two of these two spinners that we introduced before. So let me just call them mu alpha dot and lambda alpha. So uh, again, at this point, that's just uh, a bit of notation. But um, the reason why we've chosen that bit of notation is that uh, it's a handy way of encoding the relationship between points in CP3 and uh, complexified Minkowski space. So uh, we now define a relationship between uh, CP3 and our complexified Minkowski space M uh, through a set of algebraic relations that are called the incidence relations. So what are these? They're just uh, given by a simple equation, mu alpha dot is equal to X alpha alpha dot. So these are just the coordinates on holomorphic coordinates on complexified Minkowski space translated into our two spinner formalism. And then I contract uh, with lambda alpha. Okay, so this, this is somehow like uh, the central uh, equation uh, of twister theory for a four dimensional uh, Minkowski space. Now, uh, straight away, uh, you don't have to look at this long um, to see that not every point Z in CP3 is gonna correspond to a finite point in M, okay? So how, how can we see that? Well, uh, consider uh, points of the form ZA is equal to mu alpha dot lambda alpha equals zero. So as long as 
both of the mu alpha dot components don't vanish. This is a completely uh, okay set of homogeneous coordinates inside of CP3. Um, I have a question. I'm a bit lost. CP3 is three dimensional, complexified Minkowski four dimensional. So there's no bijection now. So what is this map? Uh, the map, yeah. Very good. Because, so so, so uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and the point is that this isn't mapping points to points. So I'll, uh, I just want to, um, okay, yeah. So for instance, if I fix x alpha alpha dot in this equation, then this is an equation for a linearly embedded Riemann sphere in CP3. So uh, points in N correspond to extended geometric objects uh, in CP3. But I'll go through that in a little more detail uh, in just a second. Is that okay? Okay, let's see. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like give me a second, and then you can uh, you can uh, ask me again if 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 the answer isn't clear. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to look at what happens to this incidence relation uh, on uh, the subset of CP3 that looks like this, where the mu alpha dot parts of the coordinates are uh, non-zero and the lambda alpha part is zero. But by this incidence relation, that's telling us that mu alpha dot is equal to x alpha alpha dot times zero, <laughs> right? Which for any finite point, in complexified Minkowski space is just zero. But this can't happen because these Zs are meant to be homogeneous coordinates. So something about the incidence relation is breaking down um, uh, for this subset of CP3 where lambda alpha vanishes uh, because Z are homogeneous. Uh, so basically, and now what I'm saying is not terribly precise uh, at all, but you can imagine that, well, the only way to make the left-hand side of this relation finite and non-zero is if these x's were somehow infinite and canceling the zero from the, uh, the lambda alpha again in some precise way, which I won't be specific about. Um, but at any rate, what this means is that uh, the incidence relation is doing something weird. It's kind of incompatible with the complex projective geometry of CP3, uh, precisely when lambda alpha is equal to zero. So what we do is we remove that subset from CP3, and then we define twister space, uh, which I'll call PT uh, for historical reasons. This is going to be the set of all Z A in CP3 such that the lambda alpha components are not equal to zero. Okay, so in particular, twister space is an open subset uh, of CP3. Okay, and in particular, we'll be using this open subset where we remove, uh, actually, I mean, this is a complex projective line. We remove the line corresponding to and the alpha equals zero. Okay, but now uh, sorry, turning sorry. to the question. Um, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, please. I, I missed a little bit. Uh, so you were talking about these ZAs, uh, which has Z0, Z1, Z4, Z2, and Z3. And then you switch to lambda and mu. And then I don't see a procedure. How can I attend from, how can I go from one uh, description to another? Okay, so, yeah, so, so, whoa. Sorry, the whiteboard went crazy on me. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, good question. So absolutely. So, so, so these ZAs are four complex numbers. Okay. And all I'm doing here with the mu's and the lambdas is saying, let me bundle the first two to a two spinner, right? So mu alpha dot is two complex numbers and lambda alpha is also two complex numbers. So this is really just a bit of notation. I'm saying, I'm going to call Z naught and Z one mu alpha dot Z2 and Z3, the components of lambda alpha, okay? They're still identified up to this overall uh, homogeneous rescaling and non-vanishing complex numbers. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, so so this, uh, this identification uh, is, is encoded inside these incident relations, yes? Uh, okay, so, so what, another way of uh, writing, right, good. So, what you could say uh, these incidence relations are is the following, Z0, Z1, 
is equal to um, x not not dot um, okay these have dot dotted indices in some sense uh, z two plus x not uh, sorry dot one Oops, let me erase that. All right, this uh, is slightly working. There we go. Okay. There we go. Plus x one not dot z three, and then down here again, you'd have x uh, not one dot z two plus x one one dot. So that's how you would write it, uh, kind of unpacking it in terms of the homogeneous coordinates z not z1, z2, z3. But here we're just packaging this into, uh, I mean, so this is a like a two spinner equation and we're just packaging it in this way. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah, cool. Any other questions at this point? I know, well, I, we still have the underlying question about the geometry of the correspondence between your space and complexified Minkowski space, but that's the thing I'd like to uh, turn to next. Okay, so um, so let's talk about this twister correspondence. So uh, first of all, given uh, some fixed point, say X in our complexified Minkowski space, what do we get in twister space? Well, uh, as ever, the idea is that the incidence relations will tell us exactly what this is. So here I have an x uh, mu alpha dot is equal to x alpha alpha dot lambda alpha, where I think of this x as fixed uh, now given to me. Um, so if I forget about projectivity, for a second, and I just think of mu alpha dot and lambda alpha as being uh, coordinates on C4, uh, for instance, then this equation is an equation for a linear holomorphically embedded complex two plane inside of C4. And then all we need to do is remember that mu and lambda carry this uh, projective scaling with respect to C star. So there's some uh, C star scaling we have to quotient by on both sides. And that is, of course, just changing that holomorphic linearly embedded two plane into a CP1 or Riemann sphere that lives inside of CP3. I mean, more specifically, uh, this should really be PT because we're not allowing lambda uh, to be equal to zero. So what the incidence relations are telling you is that uh, a point x in uh, Minkowski space, this corresponds to a holomorphic linearly embedded uh, Riemann sphere, so an S2, CP1 inside of PT. Now, okay, where, where did these adjectives come from? So it's holomorphic because I didn't have to say anything about complex conjugation when I wrote down this equation. It's linearly embedded because uh, it's linear in X and linear in mu and lambda. Uh, and so I get a CP1 inside of uh, the twister space, uh, which will denote and sometimes call a twister line. and we'll call it X, big X. So this thing is isomorphic to the Riemann sphere and lives inside of twister space. So that's one side of the twister correspondence. You give me a point in space time and I get some extended non-local uh, object in twister space, in particular, one of these twister lines. But what about the other way around? What if I take a point uh, in twister space 
what does that give me in Minkowski space? So let's take, uh, so conversely, take a fixed point Z, so in particular with uh, its kind of spinner coordinates, mu and lambda in twister space. So we want to know what that corresponds to in space time. And uh, what we can do is because, because these twister lines are always uh, holomorphic and linearly embedded, it means that just like in three real dimensions, you can always think of a point as the intersection of two lines. Um, so let's take, uh, we can do the same thing for these twister lines. So let's take Z to be the intersection of two twister lines, say X, big X and big Y. So what does that mean in real money? That means that mu alpha dot is equal to X alpha alpha dot lambda alpha for some X, but also that mu alpha dot is equal to Y alpha alpha dot lambda alpha for some Y. So I've just used the incidence relations for each uh, of the twister lines X and Y and the fact that they intersect in this point Z. And that's just what these uh, equations are telling us. But now I can just subtract one equation from the other. And that tells me that X minus Y alpha alpha dot lambda alpha is equal to zero, right? Because these mu alphas are the same uh, and that those lambda alphas are the same on both sides of the equation. So, okay, at this point you might say, all right, uh, I'm not really sure uh, what that's supposed to be telling us. But here, remember, we have a contraction on this undotted spinner index uh, alpha. So that equation is equivalent to x minus y alpha alpha dot lambda beta epsilon beta alpha is equal to zero. Now remember, epsilon beta alpha, this is the two-dimensional levi chivita symbol. So it's the kind of unique skew symmetric uh, SL2 tensor in two dimensions. So if I have two uh, spinners that I contract into this skew symmetric 2D object and I get zero, it means either one of them is zero or they have to be proportional to each other. Now, uh, we're not allowing lambda to be zero by our definition of twister space. And we wanted this point to be in twister space to be uniquely defined, which meant that the twister lines X and Y can't be the same. They have to be different. So that means X minus Y uh, thought of as a four vector uh, is, is non-zero. So that means that X minus Y alpha alpha dot has to be proportional to lambda alpha. Right, because uh, otherwise we've excluded the kind of trivial cases. Otherwise, this equation can't be uh, satisfied. Uh, so in real money, that means that x minus y alpha alpha dot, I have to be able to write it as lambda alpha and then some other two spinner uh, lambda twiddle alpha dot. That's just another way of saying that this uh, four vector has to be proportional to lambda. OK, but what did we learn uh, earlier? about four vectors that could be written as simple products of spinners of opposite chiralities. Learn that they're always null, right? So that is equivalent to saying that X and Y are null separated. In Minkowski space. So we get our first observation, which is that twister lines X and Y intersect in twister space uh, if and only if the points X and Y in Minkowski space are null separated. But more generally, what we've seen is that this point in twister space where the two lines uh, uh, intersect finds for us on space time a two complex parameter family of null vectors, right? And their parameter, the, the free variable that parameterizes them is the choice of this lambda twiddle uh, alpha dot, right? Because 
any lambda twiddle alpha dot will do. That will give me uh, an x minus y that's proportional to, to lambda, uh, which is the thing that the incidence re uh, relations told us had to happen. So further, a point z in twister space, that corresponds to a totally null complex two plane inside of Minkowski space. Uh, so by totally null, I mean every tangent vector to this plane is of the form lambda lambda twiddle um, parameterized by the choice of lambda twiddle alpha dot. Okay, so uh, there's a, a canonical picture that uh, in twister theory gets drawn here. So um, I'll put my limited artistic uh, abilities to the test. So over here on one side, we'll have a uh, complexified Minkowski space and on the other side, we'll have twister space. And so what pictorially, what this story is telling us is that if I take a point, say X in complexified Minkowski space, that's defining for me uh, a line, a uh, linearly holomorphically embedded Riemann sphere, big X in twister space. And then if I think about the um, kind of the, the null cone of that point X in Minkowski space, if I take another point, say Y, that's null separated from X, then that will define for me another line in twister space. Let's call it big Y. And those lines will intersect at a point uh, Z. So that's the sort of picture that you should have. But the, the moral of the story is that this correspondence is holomorphic because at no point did I have to talk about complex conjugate variables on the complexified Min Minkowski space or in CP3 or, or twister space, and it's non-local because uh, points on one side become extended geometric objects on the other side. A point in Minkowski space becomes one of these twister lines in twister space, and a point in twister space becomes a totally null complex two plane um, in complexified Minkowski space. So that's, those are the essential uh, nuts and bolts of the twister correspondence. Um, and, um, and a point in, on the right hand side, is it really a point or is it a, a circle or what is it? Ah, very good. So it is a point. It is really a point precisely because these lines are holomorphic, right? If they were not, if, they, if, if these CP1s were not holomorphically embedded, then, then they could intersect in things other than a point. Right? But if you have two Riemann spheres and they intersect in a circle, um, that intersection is not holomorphic in the, in the CP3 embedding space, precisely because it's a real, uh, a, a, a real not a complex uh, surface. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about this kind of twister correspondence thing? Going once, going twice, <laughs> sold. Okay, so uh, so okay, that's like some cool geometry, uh, of course. But uh, what's it good for? So um, let me uh, try and convince you that it's good for something, uh, at least at the level of linear fields in complexified Minkowski space. So let's talk about uh, zero rest mass fields on complexified Minkowski space. So uh, everybody knows what these things are, uh, even if you think that you don't. So uh, in 4D, any uh, massless free field um, of integer or half integer sp 
spin, uh, let's say s greater than zero uh, for now, uh, can be decomposed into helicity plus or minus s parts, which are represented by totally symmetric thinner fields. So the plus s helicity field, this is just something we'll call phi twiddle, and it has dotted spinner indices, alpha one dot up to alpha dot twice uh, the spin. So if you're spin s, you have two s totally symmetric uh, dotted spinner indices, so this is a, lives on space time, and the negative s, uh, the negative helicity field, that's just phi alpha one up to alpha two s of x. Now, because we're doing everything complexified, these fields are uh, a priori independent, but if we wanted to restrict to Lorentzian real signature, they'd be related by complex conjugation. And that's what this twiddle is sort of meant to suggest, uh, is that if you were Lorentzian real, that twiddle would become a bar. And then the Lorentzian reality conditions exchange the spinner representation. So, um, so anyway, uh, and uh, again, every, you, you all know what this is, uh, these representations are, even if you, you feel like you haven't. I mean, if I set S equal one, so we're talking about photons, uh, in Minkowski space, then I just have two uh, dotted indices on two or two undotted indices on each side of this. And then those are just the self-dual and anti-self-dual uh, photons or parts of the Maxwell field strength, uh, the electromagnetic field strength in, in four dimensions. So uh, I always find it useful to have some kind of uh, specific ex example of this that I'm carrying around in the back of my head. What do you mean? This one is a good one. Could you make this more explicit? Yeah, sure. So, um, so uh, let's do. Yeah, let's treat this as an example. So, uh, consider s equal one. So that means we have some gauge field a alpha alpha dot and a field strength f alpha alpha dot beta beta dot. And that's just d alpha alpha dot a beta beta dot minus d beta beta dot a alpha alpha dot. So just the usual thing where all I've done here is replaced kind of the usual Lorentz indices with our pair uh, of spinner indices. So is everyone happy with an expression like that? Um, okay, but now what I can do is I look at this f, uh, the, the, the field strength, and I say, well, okay, this is skew symmetric on uh, interchange of the pair. So, so in particular, if I take F alpha alpha dot beta beta dot, I know that that has to be equal to minus F beta beta dot alpha alpha dot, right? I mean, that's just built into the definition, of course. Um, now, uh, two things can happen. Either F, is skew symmetric under the interchange of the undotted spinner indices and then symmetric under interchange of the dotted ones or the other way around. Because these are two-dimensional, uh, two-component spinner indices, nothing else can happen. Those are the only, uh, the, only, the only kind of representations available to you. So what that means is that I can decompose F alpha alpha dot beta beta dot into a piece that's anti-symmetric on alpha and beta. And because in two dimensions, there's only one anti-symmetric object available, that means that it's just proportional to epsilon alpha beta times something f twiddle alpha dot beta dot, which is symmetric in alpha dot beta dot, and then the other way around. So epsilon alpha dot beta dot f uh, alpha beta. So these things, are what I'm calling phi twiddle alpha dot beta dot and phi alpha beta. Okay, so that is, does that make it clear how the two spinner formalism is playing with the usual Hodge decomposition of two forms oh, into self dual and anti self dual parts? Absolutely, thank you very much. No, it's a pleasure.
Okay. And then, um, so this, again, this is a good example. Uh, thanks for pushing me to, 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 to make that more explicit um, because this is a good example to keep uh, in the back of one's mind. So then um, these, you could then ask, okay, so in this spinner representation, what does the massless free field equation look like? Well, it always, it has a kind of uh, spin agnostic form. So the zero rest mass equations, These are the free field equations, it's just a fancy way of saying uh, linear massless free field equation in the spinner representation. And they look like you take one derivative, say alpha, alpha dot one, and you contract it on the dotted index into the dotted field. So we had two S of these equals zero. And then the negative helicity version is just uh, the, the kind of uh, chirality conjugate. So. And so I'll leave it as an exercise using this spin equal one case that we've worked out here. If you uh, take a purely positive or negative helicity, so let's let's say take a purely positive helicity photon, that means you set this F alpha beta equal to zero, then it's easy to see that this equation, so this top equation, when S is equal to one, that just is a, uh, the, the Bianchi identity or, or Maxwell's equation, uh, they're actually equivalent in, in, in that case uh, for, for this phi twiddle, okay? So these just are the, uh, the linear field equations when you write things in terms of uh, these, these two spinners. Of course, um, if S is equal to zero, then you just get the, the wave equation. Uh, so then there's two derivatives to worry about, but, but generically you have uh, this structure where you have one derivative contracted on one of the spinner indices into these kind of uh, zero rest mass fields, okay? So for instance, if you wanted to talk about scattering amplitudes, uh, these zero massless scattering amplitudes in four dimensions, these zero rest mass fields, they're the things you need to LSZ truncate the external legs of your scattering process onto. So um, my claim is that twister theory will give us a, a really nice way of generating solutions uh, to these equations. Again, essentially an unconstrained way of doing it. But let's um, let's also just like do another example here just to make things uh, completely, uh, ho hopefully <laughs> completely clear. Um, so we have these zero rest mass fields, zero rest mass equations. Can you give me an example, say of a solution, uh, for instance, for momentum eigenstates? So this is something uh, that's hopefully uh, kind of, uh, will be familiar to many of. So by momentum eigenstates, I mean um, states proportional uh, to e to the i k dot x. And because these are zero rest mass fields, in particular, they're massless fields, um, that means that k has to be null. Now, uh, again, what was the first sort of nice fact that we talked about today, if k is null, that means that k alpha alpha dot can be decomposed into some two spinners, say kappa alpha, kappa twiddle, alpha dot. We allow this momentum to be complex. So in particular, kappa and kappa twiddle are a priori unrelated because we're working on complexified Minkowski space. So then um, it's easy to see that uh, momentum eigenstates that will solve these zero rest, zero rest mass equations are just given by say phi twiddle uh, alpha dot one up to alpha dot two s, you just take the dotted momentum spinner alpha dot one and throw it down two uh, s times times e to the i k dot x, and for the negative helicity fields you just take alpha for two s and you throw down the undotted one two s times. And it's obvious that these will solve the zero rest mass equations because if I take a derivative, the only x dependence is in the exponential, I bring down a k, um, but then I contract on one of the, the relevant one of these spinner indices, which will just give me either a kappa twiddle contracted with a kappa twiddle or a kappa contracted with a kappa. The contraction is by the levi civita symbol, which is anti-symmetric. So kappa twiddle, kappa twiddle, or kappa kappa vanishes. So uh, such things will, will uh, indeed solve the zero rest mass equation. So again, that's some sort of uh, toy example 
um, that one can have in the back of one's mind. Um, but the, this is kind of one of the first uh, greatest hits of, uh, of, of twister theory, um, which is something called the Penrose uh, transform. And what this is, is uh, actually a very non-obvious uh, isomorphism between the set of all helicity H zero rest mass fields on M. So there's some, some missing adjectives here like suitably analytic, but uh, for now let's sweep those under the rug very cavalierly. Um, if you've, you've been hearing from Mike Eastwood earlier today and he would uh, probably crucify me for doing that, but okay. Um, the claim is that all kind of suitably well-behaved helicity H zero rest mass fields on M, that space of solutions is just equal to a first cohomology class on twister space valued in some sheaf, 2H minus two. So here, I'm gonna use this notation curly O K. This is just the sheaf of locally holomorphic uh, functions, uh, which are homogeneous of weight K on twister space. So in particular, um, if I think I have some, sort of, in other words, uh, I have some F of Z, so some function that lives on twister space, and I rescale it by a non-vanishing complex number R, F is valued in this curly O to the K if that goes like R to the K uh, times F of Z. Okay, so, so really, uh, you know, my, my personal perspective on this field is that uh, an expression like this, if, if you maybe have more of a physicist's training rather than a mathematician's training, you may find such an expression uh, a bit daunting to parse, but at the end of the day, it's really just about differential forms whose uh, weights under projective rescalings are a particular integer. So it's just counting the weight of homogeneous functions at the end of the day. But anyway, the, what this Penrose transform is telling us is that given any such cohomology class on twister space, I will get a helicity H zero rest mass field on space time. And furthermore, all or all suitably behaved such zero rest mass fields arise in such a way. So um, it turns out proving the latter statement is uh, involved, mathematically involved. I was gonna say difficult, but it depends who you are, um, uh, whether you think it's difficult or not. I think it's difficult, but, uh, but but uh, but actually proving the other way around is relatively easy. So uh, so let's let's work through that really quick. So so let's say that we're that we're given uh, some f, uh, which is uh, not one form. So uh, okay, I'm going to work in a Dolbo representation uh, of of the cohomology group. So. It's a one form uh, whose form in uh, components point in the anti-holomorphic directions on twister space. In other words, this has to be equal to something that's like F A bar D Z A bar. Uh, so this is on twister space and we'll say that it's valued in two H minus two for uh, let's assume that H is less than zero uh, for now. Okay, so uh, what we can do is we can build a space-time field that has the right structure to be a negative helicity zero rest mass field using an integral uh, on twister space. So how will we do that? So we're going to take the thing we want to build is something that has two into the absolute value of H uh, symmetric undotted spinner indices, right? And so on twister space, this thing is supposed to be local on space time. So in particular, a function of a position X. So on twister space, what is a space time point? It's one of these twister lines, right? So the only thing we can do is take the twister line, 
uh, corresponding to that point X and then integrate out the, uh, the kind of CP1 dependence or integrate over uh, the twister line that we have. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna take um, a differential form on CP1. I'll define what that is, a holomorphic differential form on CP1. And then we're gonna wedge it against two to the absolute value of H uh, copies of the homogeneous coordinate lambda alpha uh, on twister space. And then I'm gonna take this differential form that I've been given and I'm gonna pull it back to the twister line. So what do I mean by the various ingredients here? Here, D lambda, this is just lambda alpha, D lambda alpha. So in other words, this is a uh, one zero form on twister space that's homogeneous of weight two. So maybe this, if nothing else, this will give you an example of how to read uh, this kind of sheaf, uh, sheaf value differential form notation. Um, and what I mean by f restricted to x, well, that just means take f, which is a function of z, so in particular mu uh, alpha dot and lambda alpha, and I restrict it to the twister line using the incidence relations. So that just means I evaluate it on top of the incidence relations for the twister line x. Now, the reason why this formula makes sense is the following. So because I'm integrating over CP1, I need a 1-1 one, one form on CP1 for the integral to make sense. I need a top differential form. So this D lambda is a 1-0 form. F is a 0-1 form on twister space. When I pull it back to the twister line, it will be a 0-1 form on CP1. So I get a 1-1 one, one form. So uh, the differential form degrees work out. But I also need a homogeneous object. Otherwise, this integral isn't projectively well-defined. Now, F is weight 2H minus 2, where we assume that H is less than 0. And this uh, thing that I've multiplied it by is weight 2 uh, from the lambdas plus 2 into the absolute value of H from these. Uh, for, so that's the D lambda plus all the 2 into absolute value of H sort of raw lambda insertions here. And so the weights cancel. Uh, with the assumption that H is, H is less than zero. So, so this space-time field is, is well-defined uh, in the sense that given any such F on twister space, I can define uh, a space-time field that has two into the absolute value of H symmetric undotted spinner indices. But uh, we haven't established that this thing will solve the equation of motion yet. Um, so to do that, we observe that provided that this F is holomorphic. So in particular, in an equation, that means that d bar of f is equal to zero, where d bar is the anti-holomorphic Dolbeau operator on CP3 or on twister space. Um, so provided f is holomorphic, uh, we can compute d, say, alpha one, alpha dot acting on this field just by taking the derivative inside of the integral sign here and then using the incidence relation. So that will give us, so I have my D lambda, lambda alpha one, lambda alpha two H. And then using the incidence relations, this derivative just becomes lambda alpha one D by D mu um, alpha dot acting on F restricted to X. But, uh, here, this means I have a lambda contracted with a lambda. And what do we know about that contraction? It's anti-symmetric. So I'm contracting something symmetric with an anti-symmetric inner product. That has to give me zero. So by construction, as long as this F is holomorphic, uh, we've generated a solution uh, to the zero rest mass equations in this way. So these, these integral formulae are sometimes called uh, Penrose, Penrose transform integral formulae. But um, but it turns out that there's there's a bunch of trivial solutions uh, hidden in here that we want to get rid of. So uh, recall that these uh, the 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 Dolbo operator always squares to zero. So d bar squared um, is equal to zero. So uh, we can trivially get uh, f's that are d bar closed. 
uh, by taking f is equal to d bar of g for some g, uh, which is a function on twister space of the correct weight, so 2h minus 2. Um, but if you plug that g in for f in this integral formula, get phi alpha 1 up to alpha 2 h. This is equal to integral over x d lambda lambda alpha 1 lambda alpha 2 h d bar pulled back to the curve uh, g pulled back to the curve. But now there's nothing else in the integrand that's anti-holomorphic. So I can just pull all of that stuff inside d lambda and alpha 1 lambda alpha 2 h uh, g. And that's a total derivative right? because x is uh, compact without boundary in particular CP1. So that's equal to 0. So Anytime we use one of these exact representatives, so something that's equal to d bar of something else, the zero rest mass field we get on space time is trivial. It's just the zero field, which obviously solves whatever linear equation of motion uh, you throw at it. So the idea is that to get non trivial solutions, we want to take. Uh, we want to take f's that are uh, closed, so holomorphic, annihilated by d bar, quotiented by f's that are kind of trivially d bar closed or exact. And this thing is precisely the Dolbo cohomology group um, that we were working with. So um, there, so I, I've worked through this for you for um, uh, negative helicity fields, so h less than zero, but I'll leave it as an exercise uh, to show that this works. For positive helicity fields with the integral formula phi twiddle alpha dot one up to alpha dot two h of x equal to an integral again over x d lambda but now i take d by d mu alpha dot one up to d by d mu alpha dot two h f restricted to x okay so that's that's a little exercise so i see i've, I've already gone uh over time uh which means that i was wildly over ambitious uh with the stuff that i thought i was going to be able to cover today so um, let me stop here for today and propose the following thing for tomorrow, and then you guys can tell me, uh, y'all can tell me uh, whether you think this is a good idea or not. What I would propose to do tomorrow is to pick up from where I left off here today uh, to kind of finish the four-dimensional twister space story I wanted to tell you, and then we'll get as far as we get uh, with the ambi twister space story, and we can just play it by ear to see how far we get tomorrow. Um, are are, are y'all happy with that? Or I could just stop here and then jump right in with uh with with Ambi Twister theory tomorrow, but then we haven't learned anything about scattering amplitudes yet. Sorry, I'll stop sharing here for a second. Well, what's what 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 seems interesting? So it's probably you can answer and if there are some concrete proposals, maybe we leave it up to you. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do either. I think I think maybe it makes more sense to keep going with this um, uh, until we reach some sort of natural conclusion. And then the, the, the thing I'm, of course, willing to do tomorrow is just uh, to go as long as you want me to. But I'm sure, uh, how, how tight is this? Because presumably it's lunch after this, right? <coughs> Yes. So, uh, yeah. So, it, I mean, it, it, it depends how much of your lunch you want to <laughs> you want to you want to give up tomorrow. Um, but, but yeah. So, so maybe what I'll say tomorrow is that I'll pick up here from where I left off today, and then we can see how we're going and how. Um, of course, yeah. It's entirely, uh, you know, it's choose your own fate 
uh, you can decide how much you 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 get to hear. Um, um, so maybe what we could do is to nevertheless make one hour strict, and then I think after fifteen minutes, optional, informal. Yeah, so sure. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I'm happy with that. One minute break. People who <laughs> rush for lunch go for lunch, and maybe you can have like fifteen minutes more. Yeah, yeah, that would that, that would be a pleasure. Desperately <laughs> interested in this business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So that, that, that's what we'll do tomorrow then. Um, but yeah, at, at this point, I should ask, are there any questions about uh, what I've said today so far? Yeah, I, I, I didn't understand the, the, the calculation of this D alpha alpha dot on phi. Uh, the, 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 the integration depended on X. Mm -hmm. So some I would have expected that the boundaries are affected by the integration, so by the differential. Uh, so, so why was this not the case? Uh, okay, good. So, um, right. So, so the integral is over x, but x is a Riemann sphere, so it's compact without boundaries. So we don't need to worry about uh, any boundaries. And then the point is on on twister space when you're changing x, that's always kind of pointing in the mu direction. Really, all you do is just do change of variables where the variable change is defined by the incidence relations. And then d by dx goes like lambda d by d mu. Just use your chain rule. <laughs> and then that's what you bring inside, um, bring, you know, when, you, when you're inside the integral, when you're restricted to x, um, that, that change of variables is the valid one to make. The reason why you have to assume that it's holomorphic is because if you don't, then there's sort of a complex conjugate <laughs> chain rule you could also in principle write down. And that would not be automatically zero. So that, that, that wouldn't give you something that was a solution of the zero rest mass equations if you were not holomorphic. Um, sorry, does, does that answer your question? Maybe, uh, okay. The question is no boundary. <laughs> so are there any, any other questions? Uh, maybe. If I'm not mistaken, it's worthwhile to comment on one tricky moment. So you you explained spin one case where indeed this equation corresponds to just mass. Your f is zero. Well, if you go, for instance, for spin two, then it's not any longer just a spin two equation. It's an equation of the self dual. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, because in terms of in terms of spin to field, this is going to be third order or something. Like yeah. So so that, that's a really good that's a, that's a really good point. So I mean, for for spin beyond one, right? The, I guess the real thing to say is that the, these are because we assume they're linear massless fields that are well-defined asymptotically. It's like for the radiative part of the field, which would be like the vial tensor. Um, so, 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 so absolutely these, you know, if you had four spinner indices, that's the, the vial, the linearized vial tensor that you're defining, but that's of course the radiative part um, of, of, of the Riemann tensor. And similarly for higher and higher spins, uh, you know, there's, there's many more uh, kind of tensorial invariants that sit between these two guys in your in your expansion that have traces, I guess would be. Yeah, you should think of them as traces of the um, the kind of generalized Riemann, linear generalized Riemann tensor. But we're just interested in the traceless parts because those are the things that will escape to, um, to scry, so to speak. But yeah, you're of course correct, yeah. <laughs> 